Well, good morning. Man, I hope you're doing well. I, I told the other services, I feel like every Sunday I preach here, it's cold and rainy. And I know it's, I know it's January, February, but I'm like, Lord, give me one great, beautiful, like 60 degree day. Uh, turn to Acts chapter two with me, uh, if you will. I try not to take that stuff too personal, you know? Like I try not to read into it, like uh, God's trying to, to tell me something. Um, Cause that is just the world we live in. And I think the beauty of uh, the book of Acts is a reminder that the gospel continues and the church of God continues even in obstacles. In fact, I would almost say that what Acts shows us is that we need obstacles in order for the church to thrive, right? So you and I are constantly kind of looking for, um, to, to be more comfortable and we're looking for like the easiest path in life oftentimes. And yet uh, the church of God thrives when it faces a wall for us to overcome, and so in these moments, I, I think it's a, a really great thing just to celebrate uh, the fact that um, Reckless had so, such a great uh, turnout this weekend, but also the seven people who decided to follow Jesus and the eight that were baptized this morning and 15 across all campuses. God is truly at work, and that is awesome that he is Amen. growing his church, right? We're a part of that. So let's celebrate what he's doing. Um, I know just, just like anything, Reckless is a tool, right? It's a, it's a vehicle, a contextual vehicle for us to take the gospel and implement that somehow into a student's life so that they can understand it. And just like that, we're building a new building, we're building a new facility. I know Tracy mentioned that. Um, next week, we'll break ground on that. So that is super exciting, but it's just a tool, right? It's just a vehicle for us, an opportunity for you and I to be able to reach more people for the kingdom's sake, for the upstate uh, and what God is doing here. And so if you want to join us uh, next Sunday at 2 p.m., we're going to have a dedication service. Um, it, it probably won't be super long. I'm just going to go ahead and say, bring an umbrella and a jacket. All right. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's probably inevitable. And, and we're going to go out there and we're going to pray together over that tool that God would use that building as an opportunity for other people to experience the life-changing message of Jesus as a result of that opportunity that we have together. So join us next week at 2 p.m. Uh, that will be great. And then the week after that, the 26th, is actually going to be our uh, commissioning service for our Haywood folks from Harrison Bridge. So I'm excited that we get to do this. Uh, this will be really great. We've got a great group from um, Harrison Bridge that is going to be a part of our Haywood campus. And that is truly a, an amazing blessing, right? God's going to use uh, that campus the way he's been using this campus. And God's going to continue to expand his kingdom. So be here on the 26th for that. That will be awesome uh, time for us. And I will tell you, Harrison Bridge folks, we're going to start feeling that pinch a little bit. Um, as people start joining Haywood. Now, I've, I'll just reiterate what Dallas has said. If you haven't replaced yourself yet in volunteering, um, then you need to continue volunteering in those spots until uh, you go out there. But man, I am excited because we as a Harrison Bridge campus also have the ability to step up a little bit. Uh, I know there's uh, about seven spots with kids. I think there's four or so with student ministry. And I know there's some with our connections ministry as well. So um, if you have yet to really engage in serving in that way, we really want to encourage you. This is the time to do that. We're going to start feeling that pinch at the end of the, the month, okay? So um, that's a good thing. That's a great thing because it's a, it's a growth thing, right? Yeah. And we're kingdom-minded, and we are super, super excited about this. Um, but we also need to take it serious, all right? So we need, to, we need to realize, like, God has called us here, and we have a huge uh, uh, plan ahead of us. Um, so we're going through the book of Acts in the series called Sent. The idea of that, and the first week we talked about it, God calls us as believers to be sent to the world, right? He says, you will be my witnesses, all right? He didn't say like, hey, please be my witnesses, right? He didn't say, I hope you will be. He said, you will be my witnesses. Now, you have to decide what kind of witness are you going to be. But we are, as a church, sent to the world, he has sent us out and said, you will be my hands and feet. You will extend grace. You will find opportunities to, to share the love of God to the world around you. How are you doing that? Now, let me just say, I'm so thankful last week I went back and watched Corey's message. So thankful Corey was here. I uh, love and appreciate him even this weekend leading um, with our, our student ministry and Elise doing such an incredible job at our campus. So um, we can just give it up for Elise. That would be great. Um, she loves all of the attention, so give her all of the attention possible. Um, Corey preaching last week, just reminding us that the gospel in verse 22, clearly in Acts 2, 22, uh, stated, he says, men of Israel, hear these words. 
Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him and in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. When you see lawless, sin is lawlessness. So we say in sinful men, God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And what a beautiful reminder that the simple explanation of the gospel is right there in Acts chapter 2. And as Peter shares this miraculously, 14 or whatever it was, different types of nationalities, different types of, um, of languages, heard it in their own language, and there were 3,000 people respond to the gospel on that day. What an incredible move of the Spirit of God. Now, what we have to be reminded, too, is the book of Acts is written as a historical book. It's written to actually describe the events of the early church. It's not meant to be prescribed to us, all right? We're not trying to reproduce what's already happened. God's already done that. We're trying to continue on the mission that God's already given us as the church. So when we read in Acts chapter 2, we can celebrate that as a church. This is where our church started in many ways, right? We can look back and be like, okay, our church began here in Acts chapter 2 as God used Peter to, to lay out the gospel and 3,000 people, mega church born overnight, right? Like in this case. And so what we're going to talk about today is verses 42 through 47 on how we implement or how the church really began to implement the things that they understood and knew about life and about what God had called them to. So I'm going to start with this question, because if we live sent, if we are the sent church, I want to start with the question of, when was the last time you shared the gospel with somebody? Now, let me even, like, I'm going to clarify that question. Over the past 12 months, how many times have you shared the gospel with somebody? Now, I don't mean like, oh, I bought, like, somebody's cappuccino in the line behind me at Starbucks. I mean, how many times were you able to sit down and share the gospel face-to-face -face with another person. Now see, this command, this, this idea to be sent is not, hey, let's send the interim campus pastor out there. It's his job, right? Let's send the pastor to go preach because it's the pastor's job to preach. It is the command for all of us Christians to assume that we as the church, we together are saying God is calling us to be the church to the world. The church is not a building. The church is a people. We have to realize this, this idea of church has to be brought down to me. Now, I recognize that a lot of people in church or a lot of people in the world will say, well, I'm not going back to church because I've been hurt at the church before. Um, and you know what? Like, I've been hurt by the Bulldogs for 40 years. <laughs> and I still rooted for the Bulldogs. And now we're back-to-back -back champs, right? Like, there's an illustration there, I'm sure. But but, but truthfully, we've all been hurt, and the tendency for us would be to lean out, right? To lean away. Here's what we have to recognize. The church is full of imperfect people, right? You and I aren't perfect. We have a tendency to look across the room and be like, man, that guy's got his life together. I mean, look at that head of hair, you know? <laughs> like, gosh, I wish I could have that, right? Like, and, and, and we tend to, to make these, like, judgment calls, and, and what we need to do is say, you know what? Like, we are all imperfect people. Hurt people hurt people, right? When somebody's hurting, they lash out at other people. We have to recognize that as a church, God, God has called us to go, okay, I, re I realize we will not be perfect. I'm not even achieving or, or seeking after perfection. What I do want to do is extend grace to other people the same way that Jesus has extended grace to me, right? What I do want to do is make sure everybody that walks through that door is, is going to experience somebody who wants to, to show the love of God to them. Now, I worked in student ministry for 20 years, and it was the, the people who would always go like, man, nobody talked to me at church. Like, I went in there, and nobody even said anything. And I was like, you were in the corner on your phone the whole time. You know, like, nobody's going to walk up to you and snatch your phone away and be like, I'm forcing you to have eye contact with me, okay? Like, at the end of the day, the, the, it, it takes a responsibility on our part, though, to say we as the church want to be looking out for those people, the people who might be out on their own or maybe a little nervous or uncomfortable or the people that might be walking through difficult times, that we as the fellowship, as the church of God should be saying, let me go extend some grace to that person. It's, it's really easy to find the cool, like loud uh, person that everybody loves and be like, let me hang out with you and your group. It's really a different thing for God to say, God is calling me as the church to actually walk into a, a situation that might be difficult or awkward, but I want to be there for that person. 
Because God has given me a platform to share the gospel. God has given me an opportunity through my experiences to be the hands and feet of Jesus right now. I think sometimes we think, well, gosh, man, like if, if I've just been through it. Well, the reason you've been through it is somebody else is about to go through it, and you're going to be able to tell them why they should hang on to Jesus in the middle of that. So if God's given you that special gift, don't keep it to yourself. Like, find a way to express that grace to the world around you. Now, the reason I preface with that idea, because God has called us to be sent, and as we see the church uh, forming, <coughs> excuse me, in verse 42, we can see what the church did and how they lived. Let's, let's read those together in verse, verse 42. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day they were attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is such a, this is a, such a cool uh, set of verses to us that immediately following the movement of God, immediately following thousands of people deciding to follow Jesus in that day, we see a, a move of God actually working together to be the body of Christ. And let me say this. Healthy fellowship leads to healthy mission. Healthy fellowship leads to healthy mission. If there is not healthy fellowship, then, then it will hurt the healthy mission, right? We, we will not have a unified mission if we decide that we want to fight or argue about things that do not matter. And while we think of the, the church as a building or an institution, the Bible describes the church as a bride, the bride of Christ, as a vineyard, as a flock of sheep. The word ecclesia, meaning God's peop, called out people, people who are called out of darkness and into light. In fact, even the early church in Acts we would see if we went back and looked at the original language, they would describe themselves as the way. It was a movement. And so the first thing I want us to notice that the early church did is they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. In verse 42, it says that very quick. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. They were continually devoting themselves to to the apostles' teaching, which is a mark of a healthy church surrendered to the Spirit. So let me say it this way, because for, in their case, they didn't have the New Testament to look at, right? An apostle is someone who's been in the presence of Jesus. A disciple is somebody who follows Jesus. We're all disciples. We are not apostles. And so in this case, the apostles were literally writing Scripture uh, during that time as the Lord would inspire that. And, and, and so what they were uh, doing is, is saying, men, you should value the Word of God above anything else. You're like, well, Pat, I really want to grow in my walk spiritually. Well, you, you need to get into the Word of God. You're like, well, I'm struggling with some things in my life, and you have no idea. G get into the Word of God. Man, I want some victory, and I'm just... There's some, there's some sins that are getting me down. Get into the Word of God. The healthy church, a Christian who is healthy, who is following the Lord, needs to elevate the Word of God above anything else. Now, we, we've, we've done this uh, incorrectly, right? Because um, we, we have elevated other things above the Word of God. That's even our preference, right? Like, if next year we decide not to have reckless because there's a different vehicle that God wants to use, there will be people that will be like, well, I can't believe that we would get rid of reckless. I mean, I just love reckless. It was so good. And here's the deal. At the end of the day, we cannot elevate anything above the importance of knowing and following Jesus. And yet we do that all the time. And we think, well, like, I don't know. I don't know if I like that song, you know, Larry's <laughs> style. I liked him five styles ago, you know, Larry's always got a different style. He's the coolest. Um, and, 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 and we get to this point where we make it about ourselves. And, and here's the deal. We need to be focused on the fact that the only life-changing message that we have comes out of this word right here. That, that you and I realize that this is infallible and perfect and profitable for us in everything. And so if that is true and we believe that to be true, we should get to know this book. In fact, it's a library of books that we should get to know. And God speaks through his word. We even shared a couple weeks ago 
Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Even our worship is sprung out of our love for the Lord and his word dwelling inside of us. We could get to a point where we elevate music above other things. We get to a point where we elevate buildings above other things or people above other things. Lord knows there's some people worship in churches. We've got to get to the point where the thing that matters most to us is the word. And faithful churches center worship around the word and growing in it. And this is for all believers. This isn't just for for me, right? Or whoever else is up here. This this is for all of us to embrace. All true movements of God and spiritual awakenings start with the Word of God at the center. Now, I I was in uh, college at Liberty. I I double majored in um, biblical studies and and youth ministry. And in our youth ministry classes, we actually had to uh, plan an entire year out and, and put them out there. And so, you know, you had to plan your messages. I didn't have to have my points, but I'd have to have like main idea and scripture. Um, you had to have all your events planned. I was, <clears throat> I had a band show up at one of my camps, uh, fictitiously, um, called Passion, P-A-T-I-O-N, like ration, but, uh, with me at the center of it. Um, I thought that was creative, but I was, n- I'm not as cool as you guys think I am, you know, like that's just the reality of this world. And, um, and my Wednesday night service that I had was called the meat department. I know it was not creative. I, I mean, it was weird. Um, it, it wasn't as weird back then in 2001, but, uh, but, but still, like, what, what, uh, what I kind of planned out was this idea. First Peter 2 says, like, newborn infants long for spiritual milk, that it, by it you may grow up in salvation if you've indeed tasted the Lord is good. I was like, we need to help people not just have the milk, but have the meat of the word, right? Like, we, we as Christians are too far going back to the milk, and we need to get on some solid food. That what we've just focused on is, is our spiritual uh, beginnings, and we have not grown beyond that. And God has called us as a fellowship to so put the word at our center that, that we devour it, we hunger after it. Now, let me tell you, like, what you eat is what you become. And I know there's not a single person in this room that's looked up here and said, he's like a marathon runner that only eats greens. <laughs> you know that, I'm self-aware, you, you know that's not true, Right? It's called Bluebell Rocky Road ice cream and cheesecake, right? That's what gets you to this place in life, all right? And and definitely not running. And and so at the end of the day, what we consume and what we take in is going to be what we become. I recognize that. You want to become like Jesus and you want to follow him? You need to consume his word. It needs to be what we ingest. It needs to be what is the substance of, of how we survive in this life. And so the church that is centered around God's word is the church that will thrive. Here's the second thing, is they were devoted to radical fellowship. They were devoted to radical fellowship. The word in Greek uh, used for fellowship is koinonia, which means having a share in. They actually had a part of what God was doing. Let me read these verses in 44. It says, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. I'm going to skip 45 and go to 46. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I think we have this tendency to think that maybe they all just liquidated all their assets and then threw it all in one bank account and were like, all right, let's just spread it out as need. But but it actually describes in those next verses that while they were in their own homes, they still broke bread. So this, the, the point here is not like, hey, were these guys communists? <laughs> That's not the point. The point is for us to say, okay, what it means is they had radical fellowship to recognize that in this group of people, God has called us to care about even the least of these. The people who might go hungry or the people who might be hurting, I'm going to be a part of that. John Piper said this way, the radical fellowship of these verses was an antidote to the suicide of materialism committed by the man who built bigger and bigger barns and lost his soul. This idea that we have ourselves just focused so much on what we have in our own pocket instead of what God has given us to be able to give to the world. That the fellowship of God is devoted to radical fellowship with one another. And attempting to go through life alone is dangerous. 
The early church knew this. This is why, like, when you, when you get put in, in jail and they put you in isolation if you're in trouble, like, it destroys your mind because God has built us with the innate desire to actually need other people to help us out, right? We need one another. And God's called us as a church to complement one another, to actually help one another, to, to when times are rough, the other one can, can hold them up, right? When, when times are good, we celebrate with you. The, the beauty of this is, is that we together have a common goal, a, a common desire, and that is to carry forth the message that he's given us. You and I carry this mission on our hearts to actually be his witnesses to the world, to, to make disciples of all nations. That, that is what he's called every single one of us in this room too. that's a believer in him. And we can oftentimes get distracted by that. Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. You can say one person sharpens another. It's the requirement that we need each other in order to become more like Jesus. Now, I, I, probably the, the thing that I'm least good at is premarital counseling, truly. Um, I think that brings me so much anxiety in my life. Um, but one thing I do usually share is uh, that oftentimes, it's maybe not the best illustration, but that we're like squares that God wants to be well-rounded, right? And so as, as we are rough on the edges, when, when we're in a relationship with somebody else, the goal is to actually chip off those rough edges so that we can become more well-rounded. Now, that sounds great in theory, but when it happens, it's painful, right? And anybody who's in a marriage knows that's, that's kind of true. That's kind of how it happens, right? There are ideas that I have in my head that I think are right and I think are proper and I think are good that Mel will look at me and be like, I don't know what you're thinking. That's crazy, right? And I have to be like, okay, chipping off a little edge here. You know, maybe a little too much. <laughs> Take a little le less than that next time. And so we were reminded that a healthy relationship is actually helping us become healthier people, more well-rounded people, right? Um, but because we are growing together, because we're pursuing the same united goal, and when a marriage um, isn't that way, when you don't have the same goal in mind and you start to splinter, then you start to realize this fellowship is not as healthy as I thought it was. So to have healthy fellowship means we have a united mission. I think we can go like, well, life is busy. Life is uh, life's kept me just, you have no idea, um, how many, like I could tell you all the hours I spent in my car, just taking my kids to robotics or band or whatever. I mean, it's, it's crazy. I get it. But let me tell you at the end of your life, you will not sit back and be like, you know, I wish I had spent more time in the office on that Excel spreadsheet, <laughs> right? I wish my boss would have noticed me working late every day. No, you're going to look back in your life and think, the people that I cared about the most, I wish I had more time with them. You're going to think, I wish that God actually gave me uh, those opportunities or helped me be aware of them in the moment, right? That I would be more active about jumping in on those things, even when I'm tired and even when I'm worn out, to recognize that, like, by the time your kid's 18, by the way, you, they've already spent over 90% of the time that they will spend with you in person in their lives. So, the fact that you send them off to college, I'm not trying to discourage anybody. The fact that you send them off to college is kind of like, okay, we've already done 90% of our relationship, okay? And so what you have to realize is like, I know you're tired and I know that your teenager might be a little crazy sometimes, but dig in because this is the time that you have for them and this is the time that you have with them, right? We should look at every moment as that opportunity in our lives. I know that when we're working toward the same goal, it changes things because... Um, I'm what you call an aggressive driver. Anybody else? Um, and I'm not talking against aggressive drivers. I'm definitely not trying to convict anybody in this room because I am one. But, uh, you know, it's crazy because I, I would say it's a South Carolina thing, except nobody's from here anymore. Um, but when you come to four-way stops, like, it's just, this is how it works. You take turns, right? That's how a four-way works. And if you get there before somebody else, then your turn is first. It's like getting to the water fountain in elementary school. All right? It's the same process. But for some reason, there are people that will arrive, it'll be their turn, and they start waving other people around, like, now I'm the, the you know, cop who's, who's you know, doing traffic. And you're like, no, 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 it's your turn, you're confusing everybody, you're going to let this guy go, then you want to go now, like, you want to take your turn whenever you want, it's, you're going to get in a wreck, just, just go in a line. I, I wish I had, like, a way to email random people, like, send you, I'm going to send you the instructions right now, like, over to your car. Um, and this is so true, too, because, I, I, because I'm an aggressive driver. Somebody's going below the speed limit, right? Um, 
and, and there's an opportunity to pass them, I'm going to take that opportunity 100% of the time, okay? Um, and sometimes when you're passing somebody, they hit the gas to speed up. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, are you trying to kill me? Like, because I'm a concealed weapons permit holder, and I don't think that you actually want to, to like, raise it to that level at this point, right? And, and, and so, like, I just, I'm like, we should have the same goal, the same common goal that we both get to our place that we're going as fast as legally possible and alive, right? And hopefully not with any other dents in our car. Like, that's, that's the unified goal of everybody on the road. It should be. And yet sometimes you, like even the scissor merge, if y'all know what that is, all right, it's like two lanes become one lane, right? There's not a yield sign that's like person on the right, uh, you need to stop and wait for a hole. It's that lane is equally ours, so we have to alternate to get in there, or zipper, I think I said scissors, zipper merge, right? Like we're, we're, we're going to literally like a zipper, we're going to fall in line and get into there, right? And yet people, like when you start coming up, they're like, no, no, you're not getting in front of me, right? I'm going to block you out. And they'll stare you down and honk at you. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm just saying <laughs> we don't have a unified mission. We're on the road. And the church does this, right? The, the church itself will be like, I don't know. I don't like, I don't like the way Joe plays that guitar up there. I'm going to, you know, I don't even know what that little F hole is all about. And I think that's from the devil and we're just going to like fight it. And, and we get, cause I'm just jealous of the hair and, and we just like go so hard against things that don't matter that we're like, look, if we had the same mission, those things don't matter anymore. If next week we had wooden pews in here, the only thing that would change is I would not be able to preach as long because you would be a little sore. The rest of it should not change at all because we have the same united mission together. It doesn't matter what kind of chairs we have. It doesn't matter what kind of lights we have. Those are all just tools to share the gospel. So when you and I have fellowship, we recognize that there is beauty and unity with one another. I'm not saying we're going to agree right? Because some of y'all, I, a couple years ago, I wouldn't have preached in a t-shirt and jeans on a Sunday morning on stage. That's just reality, right? I realize some of y'all may not even be there yet. That's okay. It's reckless weekend. And I was proud to wear the heaviest t-shirt I've ever worn in my life. <laughs> and it's great. And now it's wet from baptism. So even better. And, and the beauty of it is that for you and I, we, we can't get held up on these little things that don't matter when, when there is a world out there that doesn't know Jesus and we do, and we've experienced this grace, let's get on mission together and let's start experiencing some radical fellowship with one another. Let's start saying, okay, God has called us to work together. Cause let me say this, I'm gonna throw this out there. Fellowship with other believers actually reveals in our heart, our fellowship with the Lord. If our fellowship in the Lord is struggling, then our fellowship with one another will struggle also. Now, the easiest uh, litmus test for this for me is marriage, right? If you have something evil in your heart going on, and listen, I'm Scott Irish, all right? Like, I get it. Like, I am angry all the time, um, except for when I'm an aggressive driver. I'm not angry on the road. But, like, I, I understand that sometimes you just have a bad day, and your wife wants to talk to you, and you're like, I really don't want to talk. Leave me alone, right? It, distur it disturbs What's in my heart is disturbing that fellowship that should exist between me and her. And when our relationship with God is also disturbed, when our relationship with him is not where it needs to be, we don't want to look at somebody else and be like, hey man, like, how is your walk going? Because we know they're going to ask us the same question. So we ourselves should be a fellowship so committed to him and so committed to his word that it changes who we are. Let me say this, that I'm a rule follower too. That's why I said legally allowed on the road. I'm a rule follower. And you're supposed to brush your teeth twice a day, every morning and every night for at least two minutes. All right. And, um, and that means like, let's get all the teeth, right? Let's, let's, let's go everywhere. I have a Sonicare toothbrush and, um, and that thing runs for two minutes. So I brush until it turns off. Like if it didn't turn off, I'd still be in there right now. Just like, this is the longest two minutes of my life. Right. Um, because I'm a rule follower and my dentist is here, Scott, you need to test. I've never had a cavity. Okay. I've never had a cavity in my life. And so, um, so brush your teeth twice a day. But when you do that, if you brush your teeth twice a day, you're spending four minutes at minimum brushing your teeth. And most Christians do not spend on average anywhere close to four minutes a day in the word of God. You spend more time brushing your teeth so that Scott won't yell at you when you go down there than you do in the word of God that can change your life and help change who you're becoming. So let's get committed as a fellowship to what God's called us to do. 
And the last thing, just because I'm running out of time, is that, he, that the early church was devoted to sacrificial generosity. I want to go back to verse 45. It says, And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Let me say it this way. If you want to have fellowship, you must be a giver. Now, I, I know like in church we're used to hearing like, well, you must be a giver, like pass the plate. You know, that's, that's what he's here for. No, what I'm saying is to, to have fellowship with other people, it requires something of you. A few weeks ago, I said that, uh, you know, the people that are your friends are the ones that help you move, right? It's, it's that same idea. It's the same moment that's like, you know, in order to actually love people the way Jesus has called me to love them, it's going to get messy. You're going to have conversations with people that sometimes you don't want to have conversations with. There's going to be moments when there's some big game on the TV and there are other things that are more important than that. Th there are going to be moments in your life when you have to sacrifice things that you feel like are important to you because God is placing another opportunity in your path and you need to jump on that. The, the reality is that a person who is a follower of Christ, just like the early church, is devoted themselves also to sacrificial generosity. Uh, Kent Hughes said it this way, fellowship costs something in the early church. In contrast to our use of the word fellowship today, fellowship is not a sentimental feeling of oneness. It's not punch and cookies. I think sometimes we hear the word fellowship and we think fried chicken is going to be there, like involved, right? He says fellowship comes through giving and true fellowship costs. That if we want to be the church that God has called us to be, if we want to be the campus that God has called us to be, we ourselves have to be willing to sacrifice and lay ourselves down and say, you know what, I get it. Like, I know standing at the door when it's cold and rainy, this is the worst time to ask for volunteers, like, to help them do that. And yet there's somebody that's going to walk through that door that maybe it's the first time they've ever been to church, or maybe they've been away from church for a long time, and their family's hurting, and, and they just are giving God one last chance. And the fact that you are holding that door for them and smiling as they come in might actually help them feel welcome enough here that they receive the Word of God and follow Jesus. And maybe you're like, I don't know, like... Um, uh, you know, changing diapers isn't my thing, or like hanging with kids is not my deal. I've, I scared kids until I had kids, right? I still sometimes scare kids. I don't know why. I don't have a bald head or what. And you may be thinking like, oh, that's me. And, and yet, um, here's, here's what I'm saying. There may be a family who's come through here and they're like, man, we're just, we just need like an hour without the kids crying. We just need an hour to get our minds in gear. We, we, we're going to give church this shot. And, and you actually may be saving a marriage or saving a family by changing a diaper, but that God has actually called us as we go to radical fellowship, not to put ourselves first, but to start recognizing that he has other priorities than we have. So I'm excited about the days ahead because I believe that Harrison Ridge is going to step up. I believe that Haywood is going to impact Greenville and begin the start even as we move up that direction with future campuses coming out of it hopefully in the next couple years that God will continue to motivate us as a church to be united around one mission not not a goal of making sure everybody understands that logo that they see on our cars but the goal that they would know Jesus because of the way that you and I live and love one another let's pray father I thank you for the room today and the, and the church that has showed up to be your church today. Father, help us to extend a hand to each one uh, around us, to, to love people around us and celebrate what you're doing. Father, we celebrate those who this weekend experience what it means to move from death to life, who experience what it means to become new creatures in you. Father, we thank you for the ministry of our student ministry and our student ministry leaders. God, we thank you for the host homes and so many other people who poured in to this weekend. God, even this morning, we celebrate the 15 at our church all over all campuses who have decided to make public the profession of faith that has already happened in their hearts, Father. We thank you that we get to be a part of a church that celebrates your word reigning and ruling. And so, Father, this morning we want to lean into your word. We want to ask that your word would change us and mold us, that, Father, you'd give us a hunger and a desire to act like this early church and to know that it requires some sacrifice, but we want to pursue you and we want to pursue your truth above anything else. Father, I pray for the person in this room that doesn't know you, that today would be the day that they decide to follow you, that today would be the day that they let somebody know next to them or let one of us know that it's, it's time to follow Jesus. They want to jump in on that. And for all of us in this room, 
Can we leave this place knowing that you've called this to not be just a club, but you've called this to be a fellowship, to be your hands and feet, extending grace to the world around us as imperfect people united with one vision and one mission. I thank you and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.